Hello and a very warm welcome to the Deutsche Welle debate at the World Economic Forum Sustainable Development Impact Summit in New York. I'm Sarah Kelly. Today we're having a look at what should be done in an increasingly unstable geopolitical environment in order to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which aim to promote peace, wipe out poverty, and protect the planet by the year 2030. How can security strategies be better aligned with those development goals? The challenges are great. Issues like climate change are increasingly seen as exacerbating conflict, as communities clash over vital resources, sometimes even being displaced. We'll look at the challenges and possible solutions. Joining me now, I have a very distinguished panel, the CEO of the World Bank, Kristalina Gorgieva the Secretary General of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, Thomas Greminger, the President of the Inter-American Development Bank, Luis Alberto Moreno, and the African Union Special Envoy on Women, Peace, and Security, Binta Diop. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us here today. And ladies and gentlemen, please, let's give our panel a very warm welcome. Now, before we can talk about possible solutions, I'd just like to get all of your assessments of the current situation, because the United Nations says the following about violent conflict. It says that the number of global conflicts that reach the threshold of war, that's more than 1,000 people per year dying because of battle, battle deaths, has more than tripled in the past decade. And Kristalina, I'd like to turn to you now, because we know that the World Bank, that um, your mission is really to, to lift people out of extreme poverty. Those people are increasingly living in conflict-prone areas. What worries you the most about the state of security and development right now? Well, the, there is a lot to be uh, concerned. Uh, you started by the sheer fact of tripling of conflicts. Uh, but I would add to this three very significant concerns. One is that in a world we can celebrate the decline of extreme poverty. Over the last 25 years, a staggering 1.1 billion people have been lifted up out of poverty. In that same world, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in other parts of Middle East in particular that are conflict affected, extreme poverty is growing. And it is growing with a troubling speed. So if we are to meet this goal of ending extreme poverty, we have to worry about peace and security first and far foremost. Secondly, we need to recognize that when there is a conflict, there are many other problems that are very severe. For example, pandemics. Right now in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, there is yet another Ebola wave. And what is on the way of stopping it? War. What we can see is that this uh, lack of security is hitting people once and twice and three times. And the third thing that worries us tremendously is uh, what you mentioned at the beginning, vulnerability to climate change. Countries that have done least to contribute to climate change very often are the most to suffer the consequences of it. And yet we are not balancing investing in mitigation, which is hugely important, with also investing in adaptation. So conflicts, what they do for health, lack of education, lack of social services, and climate. And when you have this poisonous cocktail, then the result is children, women, men with lives devastated. And I'd like to, um, perhaps a bit later, we can talk a little bit more how you, about how you address that potential devastation. Um, but first, I'd like to turn to you, Thomas, because um, as a regional security organization, 
the OSCE has been verily, very heavily involved right now in eastern Ukraine, where we're seeing the tensions between Russia and the West on full display. And so I'd like to ask you, what concerns you about security and development right now? Well, as you say, uh, violent conflict has come back to Europe, and uh, we are now uh, in the fifth year uh, of uh, this conflict. Uh, and uh, this is very much uh, on top of our agenda in the OEC um, because it uh, creates tremendous uh, suffering. Uh, it kills practically on a daily basis. It kills people, uh, civilians, combatants, uh, but it also undermines very severely uh, trust and confidence uh, among uh, the key stakeholders of your Atlantic and Eurasian security. So it has a heavy toll on the ground in terms of suffering uh, for the populations on both sides of the line of contact, but we also pay a very high political price for it. Luis Alberto, I'd like to turn to you now because um, we know that your bank is one of the large, or rather the largest long-term lender in Latin America and the Caribbean. What are your concerns about security and development? How, how do you see it progressing right now in your region? Well, it's, uh, it's paradoxical in the following sense, it's something Cristalina knows well. Latin America underwent a period of, in the 1980s, which was typically denominated as the uh, lost decade, because this was a time when you found many countries restructuring their debts with very low uh, growth rates with uh, many countries in recession for long periods of time. And there must have been, during that period alone, uh, easily 10 or 12 financial crises. The paradox is that during that time, the crime rates were far lower than they are today. In fact, Latin America today, which has roughly about 8% of the world's population, has roughly 40% of the homicides of the world. And that is a very astonishing number. And if you look at it, you know, it, it just between uh, the year 2000 and now, so almost in the last 20 years, it's almost two and a half million deaths, which is, if you just to put it in comparisons, that, that's five times the number of people who have lost their lives in this Syrian civil war, or 25 times that of Iraq. So this is perhaps the most difficult uh, issue Latin American governments have today. In fact, when you review what you know, typical polls are done, much of the focus of people is not about jobs, not about their economic situation, but rather it's about issues of security and it's around issues of transparency. And so as a result, we as a bank have had got, uh, you know, to participate in this. We cannot do, as a development bank, anything surrounding the fence. But certainly everything around, you know, helping to create citizenship, helping to work with the uh, uh, police forces in how they are modernized, in working with communities, in working with the way people are put in jail, the, how, uh, you know, the whole uh, prison population is dealt with. Uh, but this is a, a very serious issue and certainly it's an issue that is, yes, across the emerging world, but nothing as acute as it happens in Latin America. Binta, I'd like to turn to you to answer this next uh, question because we know that you focus on, on women, peace, and security on the African continent. You're, you're very much often the voice of the voiceless. Mm -hmm. What keeps you up at night when you think about security and development? I think it's, uh, I have spent most of my life in a uh, conflict zone because, uh, you know, when we talk about um, conflict, the first continent you look at is Africa, unfortunately. But I also say that when you talk about SDG, you, it's a face of African women or a young African man. That's the reality. So for me is that when I wake up and I see the people suffering, I say, yes, something can be done. Something can be done when we look at that um, this nexus, what we're discussing between uh, peace, security, and development. For me, in the middle, there are the human being. 
Let me give you one or two examples. Um, I recently visited, um, last year I went to Nigeria, northern Nigeria. This year with um, Amina Mohammed, the deputy SG, we did a joint mission to go to Lake Chad Basin. We did a joint mission, uh, we went also to see other places like Chad, but also uh, Niger. And the situation of the people, the young people and the women in those camps, to see what needs to be done. Those countries are uh, really investing, as I could see, like Chad Basend or uh, the Sahel. They are investing a lot on the military. And when we look at it with the military, the little they have, maybe 4% of their GDP, should be invested more than that on the people needs. The lake, for example, the lake chart, the lake are shrinking. And I'm very happy that we are talking to WEF today. Because I think what is important is we shift the mindset and see how do we invest in those places. When we want to achieve SDG, we need to invest on people. Water, why the lake chart was shrinking now and you see the population, women are dying more than even being raped because they're going to fetch water. So here I'm talking to development agencies that are here, World Bank and others. What do we do? How do we respond to that? We went to a small village. The man was the one supposed to be in the lakes and bringing the fish and selling it outside. The job is no longer a man because it doesn't bring anything. So you found them enrolled with who? Boko Haram. Because they don't find job, they are no longer in the lake. Yep. And the women are the one, what they need? A small boat. So we need to invest in development seriously. And investment, I'm not just saying just give them the small investment like we see, the poverty alleviation strategy that we used to see, but real investment. Because the real investment for me is those countries have sun. I say, electricity, bring them light. Because we can do that. It's possible. Great investment on the infrastructure. And this New technology. And this is something that I think that we want to explore further in our conversation also. Because I think that's... There, there, there is currently investment. I know that uh, Germany and France, for example, um, investing in the region involved um, there. But uh, first, we'd like to actually turn to um, a poll that we conducted on Twitter. Um, we actually wanted to gauge the mood and see perhaps what was important also um, for others when it comes to... Um, what do you think is most important to create global political stability? And here were the answers. Check this out. 40% of people said empowered civil society. 11% of people said strong diplomatic ties. And 49% said global economic stability. And Binta, I mean, really, to your point, you're talking about investment. And um, I'd also like to ask you, um, Luis Alberto, about that, because, I mean, that, that's also very much what you do, how do you see global economic stability um, create, contributing to political stability? Perhaps you can give us some examples of some success stories where you've seen it work um, and how perhaps those lessons can be applied and extrapolated upon. Well, certainly uh, economic stability is a road towards other forms of stability. A, a country that is in a deep recession creates tremendous uh, distresses on society that take many years to correct. This is what I was saying earlier about the, that decade of the 80s. It took a long, long time until societies were able to bring uh, trust back again. So it's critical uh, to have uh, not only the economic stability, but the also society and the wider society today believing 
and trusting institutions. And this is, I think, probably the biggest gap that we have today. Uh, technology is a way that can augment and make governments far more transparent, mm -hmm. but this more and more, uh, it's made empowered citizens. And I see it, you know, certainly around Latin America, the, the tel cell, phone, cell phone penetration, the numbers of smartphones, people today have no boundaries through, their te through the technology that they are offered, and as a result, they want to learn more. And there is a huge demand for knowledge, but at the same time, there's still a lot of lack of trust in institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, where does that lack of trust come? Partly from crime, partly from corruption, uh, and this is at the heart of what creating that sense of unity that societies need uh, that powers both economic growth and equally a strong, you know, civil society. So you brought up technology there and you brought up trust. And Thomas, um, perhaps I can ask you, because we've actually seen technology as a tool in eastern Ukraine, for example, a very powerful one in order to promote disinformation, for example. And so I'm wondering um, what opportunities you might see to build trust. The OEC is, of course, uh, a platform for dialogue. And uh, in, in that sense, uh, in, a, in a world where we are, again, uh, facing uh, a widening east-west gap, uh, we would very much uh, argue uh, for spaces for genuine dialogue uh, to rebuild uh, a trust. Um, and it all, I think, should start with, again, a serious attempt to listen to each other, trying to understand, uh, acknowledge differences, uh, identify areas uh, where we uh, identify areas where interests converge, and then try to cooperate on those areas uh, where we uh, see this uh, converging interests and, 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 and so try to re rebuild trust and confidence uh, and, and then, uh, but of course at some point in time, and, and this takes us then back to uh, Ukraine, we will have to also uh, come to terms uh, with uh, these situations if we want to, uh, well, systematically uh, uh, tackle uh, this, this trust issue. Uh, and, and I think it, it, it is a very fundamental uh, issue right now. I think historically we have never uh, seen such a uh, low in, in, in trust uh, since, I would say, uh, the early 80s of the Cold War. I want to talk a little bit more about moving beyond crisis response to also talking about crisis prevention. Um, and turn to you, um, Kristalina. How do you promote that culture as a leader? Well, the um, uh, obvious uh, statement is that uh, uh, to have a conflict prevented in human suffering and economic cost is much better than to have to live through it. The economic case is very clear. One dollar in prevention, $16 saved in the, uh, for the economy. Um, but then the question is, how can we build this culture of prevention? And uh, it goes to two things. One, the concentration of financial resources in countries that are lingering at the brink of a conflict. And the determination to stay engaged, be there. There is simply no substitute for that courage of conviction and financial resources to be paired with this courage of convictions that could make the difference between a conflict exploding and a conflict actually receding. We have seen that happening. We also have seen, seen the uh, uh, criticality of different parties coming together. And this is my second point. It is about partnerships. Of course, your screen told us something that is a fact of life. 
they have to be people that locally that feel strongly about achieving peace, right? And that engagement, empowerment of bottom-up uh, civil society organizations, women cooperatives, this is hugely important. But then we need to have the development community, the humanitarian community, and political security community all coming together. We have been for far too long fragmented. You would have the development uh, so-called actors, people like me, who say, let's see when the conflict is over, we will come and do very good development. And then you would have the humanitarian community that is there struggling, but would say these development people, they really don't understand insecurity. We have no space for that kind of fragmentation. We ought to come together and also benefit from new technologies that actually allow us to see the invisible, to pick up uh, what comes from social media as a signal that something is going wrong. Um, I would add to this a very simple message, put our money where our mouth is. We at the World Bank have dramatically increased financing in fragile situations. From, uh, we have a fund for the, for the poor countries, it used to be 7 billion three years ago, now it is 14 billion. And we are adding to this financing very targeted instruments that are, we know make a huge difference. For example, when the young men, uh, sometimes uh, women, but mostly men, decide to put down their guns, they have to have something to do with these hands. There have to be jobs. We have invested over a billion dollars in demilitarizing those who are coming out of a conflict, making sure they get into, into jobs. Um, and I am, I am actually, uh, I look at a country like Rwanda, and I say, yes, it can be done. It can be overcome, but it requires uh, locally the, 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 the uh, people to come to peace with each other, and it requires the world to stand by them. And it requires one more thing, empowering women. Mm -hmm. What President Kagame has done by pushing for more women in positions of authority, now they are like two-thirds of the parliament are women. This has gone a long way to make Rwanda a shiny example for the rest of the world struggling with conflicts. Mm -hmm. Very good, I'm very happy to see World Bank saying we invest on people. We don't help only infrastructure, we don't just support the member state, but you are going to invest on the people. Because even if you want to prevent, I think that is where we had that missing link. Mm -hmm. And that's where investment should be. When we talk about, um, and I talk about energy, because I think we need to be at the WEF to talk about the investment, the real investment. Bring the light to the people, investment. Bring water to the people, investment. Mm -hmm. How do you do that, though, um, in some areas where you might have bad governance, for example? How do you get around that? You know, um, I was listening to the debate this year of the head of state, 55, who said we are going to fight corruption. So I said, my God, yes, they will fight corruption. But let's empower the people. Mm -hmm. Because you empower the people, and the people will be the one custodian of that policy that they have signed. And it's great that they debate and say, we are going to fight corruption and sign the policy. But the accountability mechanism, you should put it in the people of the, in the hand of the people, the women and the young. They will be demanding. And with the media now, you can ask the Chevelle, you can go out and talk about accountability. So empower the people. And that is where the difference, even when we talk about prevention, I have seen now in Africa, when it comes to elections, so much violence into our election. Not just Africa, but elsewhere. How do we want to prevent those? Is give the tools, empower them, help them make sure that their civic action, 
be part of the parcel of that democratization in the continent. And tell us a little bit more about women being involved in that process. How important is that, and how do you see progress on, on that as an issue? You know, um, I always say that when you give the power to the women, you can see the difference. Great difference, because we bring an added value. We bring our own issues. We bring our humanity. I'm not saying that the men are not, because we need to be working together hand in hand. Mm -hmm. But the, the women are the ones that are the guardian of the society, especially in our culture in Africa, number one. Number two, I wanted that we go back to the issue of industrialization. You talk about the Sahel, you talk about those regions. I think like the World Bank, but other institutions, they have to put their head together and, and think the job creation. Mm -hmm. But how do we, the raw material that we have in Africa, how do we transform them and keep our young generation in the continent by making sure and being innovative? So that's why I'm very much interested to talk to the WEF today and to the World Bank, because I'm saying it can be done. Should be done. There is, you just have few investors, bold enough, creative enough, courageous enough, who can take risk. I think if we do that, and I'm sure that there are many that can invest on that, let's go to one place, let's open something that is for the women in that places and make sure that you employ their children, employ them, and I'm sure that the benefit will be the development we are looking at right now. So I think the message that I'm hearing is that more can be done if we are working together, and, and therefore, um, Luis Moreno, I'd like to ask you, what examples are you seeing in your region? Um, do you see opportunities for NGOs, private sectors, governments, um, even different regions, for example, because obviously there's a lot to be learned from Latin America as well to work together more. No question, and there is actually around the NGOs and foundations in this year through the Schwab Foundation, we have worked very closely and basically highlighting those people who are doing great work. And you know, there's a lot of social innovation that has taken place in Latin America, things like the so-called conditional cash transfer programs, which were focused on the notion that you uh, have kids who were, uh, you know, uh, were in the labor market, underage, and with the government programs basically focus at the fact that not only do you want good health for those children and their mothers especially, but equally to transfer money from the government such that they completed uh, high school programs. And through that, there's been a lot of uh, a social innovation taking place, for instance, a big movement uh, led by businesses mm. uh, in many countries to improve the quality of education, uh, to mm. do it in, in using, you know, really, uh, you know, open classrooms, ways where you can have a, uh, what they call reverse classrooms, where uh, uh, children do their homework uh, uh, in the class with the teacher and then here through massive online courses, uh, different uh, uh, parts of the teacher training. Uh, so there's a lot of things that have happened in a whole host of areas where there's been a lot of social innovation. In the area, for instance, of microcredit, mm -hmm. lots of things have happened there in the ways of how to monetize and turn uh, remittances, which we are probably one of the regions of the world that receives the largest amounts of remittances. And I'm talking here Hispanics or Latin Americans living outside of Latin America, be it the United States or Europe. So it is around programs like this, working with, with the civil society that, that we have found very successful programs. And we do work and, and do a lot of effort to reach out to those groups to bring them alongside programs that we are doing with government. Do you find that you have enough dialogue, though, with other regions, with other organizations? Would you like to see more of that, for example? Because, I mean, you're highlighting some success stories here. Right. I think that, you know, people might be interested in that. No, definitely, and, and we certainly, you know, we, we work a lot across, of course, with the World Bank, but equally with regional development banks, for instance, we're doing, helping, supporting something the Africa Development Bank is doing in trying to bring 
investment into the African continent. We're bringing a good group of Latin Americans to be part of that uh, and focused on energy. There's a lot of uh, renewable energy solutions that have been developed in Latin America. So certainly, uh, you know, looking at everything that has been done, for instance, around education in Asia, there's a tremendous amount of expertise there. Things that have been done around areas of logistics, again, from Asia, bringing those experiences to Latin America. So this kind of cross-fertilization across not only public policies, but equally how different groups who are in this space can work together. And we've done other things, like for instance, with the Gates Foundation and the Carlos Slim Foundation, focused on the 25% of the poorest in Central America and the Caribbean for neonatal care and maternal and reproductive health based on outcomes. So it's also using different business models or financial models that can uh, be uh, successful. A fascinating assessment of um, how it's working on the development front. And Thomas, I'd like to turn with you, to you now to ask you how it's working on the security front in terms of collaboration, in terms of seamlessness, because um, I was recently listening to General John Allen, the, the former coalition commander in Afghanistan speaking, and he really emphasized this seamlessness that is necessary, the communication between development and security, how, how the two go hand in hand, are intertwined, and it's difficult to make meaningful progress on one without the other. Do you think that we are getting better at that today? Is that communication getting better? But, but, I, mean, I, I would certainly uh, very much uh, support this. Uh, I think it, it was uh, late Secretary Kofi Annan that said that there is no uh, security without development and no uh, development without security. I think that is uh, definitely uh, very true. And uh, the OEC, we have a comprehensive approach to security. So, so kind of, uh, we ha started living that uh, from the early days on. Uh, if you look at the Helsinki Final Act of 1970, um, uh, five, you kind of uh, uh, realize that uh, we have a security concept that is based on the one hand on hard security, but then also on economic and environmental uh, uh, aspects, and, uh, and, and then uh, uh, on human rights, uh, rule of law, uh, democratic institutions. And uh, I think that shows this uh, uh, already uh, uh, many years ago, shows this uh, approach of trying uh, to uh, interlink uh, security and, and, and development. I want to talk now about money, funding, how you achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn to you, Kristalina, because I know that you used to run um, the budget in Europe for humanitarian efforts. Um, and right now, and you, perhaps you know the numbers a little bit better than I do, so please forgive, forgive me if uh, I don't have them exactly. Um, aid right now is something in the hundreds of billions the cost of achieving the sustainable development goals, I noticed a big poster outside, it said that it was uh, seven trillion mm -hmm. a year. That's a very big gap, isn't it? Yep. Uh, it is uh, a huge gap. It is also a tremendous opportunity for those of us who work in development finance to rethink how we use the billions. And it has become a popular slogan for a reason, turning from billions to trillions by using public money to create the enabling environment for private investments to flow. We have this uh, uh, interesting uh, solvable problem. On one hand, we have in the hands of people, businesses, countries, trillions in savings that are sitting idle. Uh, I was just uh, so surprised that cash that we keep at home or under the mattress maybe in some cases totals some five trillion dollars. So the question, the solvable problem is to create the incentive and the um, uh, platform for this money to flow into the developing world. What is necessary for that? Well, there, this is not... Um, a miracle, it is very straightforward. One, 
you need in countries policies that give the investors certainty that if they invest, what they invest in is not going to be nationalized, uh, bombed, uh, lost. So that is very important for countries to do, to create that certainty for the investor. Two, we need good projects. We need projects that you can actually see from, the begi from beginning to end how it is structured, what would it do, how it is going to be procured and implement it. And then three, we need to have the confidence of the people in the countries that this investor is not going to come and just rip them off. So it, in, in the end, when you look at it, it is all about trust and conditions for money to move. So institutions like ours, the development banks, we are fast transforming into a transmission line that creates these conditions for trust. We have right now on our books at the bank 72 projects that we structured that are dealing with institutional weaknesses, the project itself, bringing private investment, including from pension funds, from long-term investors. Are we there yet? Not quite. Are we headed in the right direction? Yes, for sure. Luis Alberto, how do we get there? No, I, look, just to build on what Cristalina was saying, Another way of saying it is we basically have a platform that reaches countries uh, in terms of their development needs. But clearly there needs to be more and we need to multiply and think that we are, for every dollar that we put in of our own financing, that we can bring some of the thousands and billions of dollars that are out there or trillions, like you know, it's $85 trillion sitting in private pension funds, asset managers, insurance companies, and the rest. What we need to do is to begin to uh, create all of the instruments that facilitate that money moving through uh, our system. And that, uh, I think, from the perspective of the owners of those uh, savings, there's a tremendous appetite to do good uh, with your savings and you know the World Bank we have done it others have done it where you go to the market and say okay this is a bond that will the, the proceeds of this bond will be devoted to a problem of health in any one country that we serve in the world there's a tremendous appetite for that there's a tremendous appetite for doing things around climate change same thing I mean and I we could go on and on so it is a question of how we mix that mismatch and how in these platforms that we have, we think of how we organize ourselves such that every time we're doing projects, we have the incentives for our staff to think that it's not enough to just do a million dollar here or there, but rather to multiply that with other sources. So beyond development assistance, you feel that the private sector is willing? Well, I, I definitely think the private sector is, is, it has a tremendous interest in being in. There are some issues of risk that we still need to continue to be smart in how we, lit we mitigate. You know, if you're giving a loan to a country in a foreign, you know, in U.S. dollar denominated debt, or is it in local currency? There's a big difference. You know, who takes that foreign exchange risk? You know, you got to understand those risks of the private sector. See which ones of those you can help mitigate by using what we call blended finance, which is using some of the development finance resources, and with that, multiply what we're doing. So this is what we are all collectively wrestling with, uh, but I think we are, as Cristalina correctly say, we're in the right direction, but we're way behind where we should be. I mean, if I, if I, if I may, just two very quick additional points to that. One is uh, examples, because you're saying, okay, is this really happening? Uh, take uh, solar in Africa. It used to be so expensive that it didn't really make economic sense. 
But then we built this kind of platform in which we aggregated all projects possible and we said to the private sector, here is certainty, there will be a consumer and there would be that minimal price. And guess what? The cost of delivering solar in Africa has collapsed. It is now so cheap that it is abundant. And the question is how to continue to scale it up. One example, two women. So we know women are fantastic in terms of paying back money they borrow. So we are now, uh, you know, a, a phone could be a device to spread hate and anger. But the phone can be a bank. And what we have done is massively increased small credits for women entrepreneurs. And, I, and, and you can see how that transforms communities uh, and makes that link between your savings and a woman in, um, say, Kenya, makes that link uh, possible. And since this is for Deutsche Welle, Welle, bravo to Germany. Germany created the so-called compact with Africa. And it is all about that. Good policies, more investments. Yeah. And Binta, I see you nodding your head, of course, next <laughs> to me, <laughs> especially when we were talking about the partnership with Germany. Um, and I just want to mention, um, because you recently convened, I know, the second forum for the Africa Women Leaders Network, um, and this was done with the support of Germany. We know. Um, we're talking a lot about what more can be done. We talked about where more money could come from. And I'm just wondering from your perspective also, who would you like to see more done from? I mean, it is, a, is it a matter of Europe investing more in Africa? From, from, which, from which areas would you like to see more? I think um, Africa have to invest in Africa. You know, we have... Uh, How? Let me just explain. Africa, it's a paradox. Everybody talk about Africa being the continent poor, and it is poor, the people are poor. But it's the richest continent when you look at the uh, resources that uh, we have. Uh, we always say that let's go back to the basic for women and the young people to support them to go to the sector that we know better. I'm coming from a village, and uh, we used to, in our land, to be agriculture. Let's go to the basic. Mm -hmm. Let's yep. feed our people. Let's make sure that our population don't die of hunger. So for me, is the expertise that Europe have, and I'm very glad that with the Madam Angela Merkel, we started looking into Africa Women Leaders yep. Network in Africa, as Africa, how do we support African women to take it from there. When we talk about microcredit, it's great because women pay back, and, uh, but we are also looking into women that are capable to, f to manage funding, bigger funding. We know that women pay back, even with the microcredit. But let's look at more or bigger resources that Africa have. So when you ask me this question of uh, where do we want Europe uh, to come in, it's the building the skills of the African, but also allowing African that are migrants to facilitate that came back and be part of the transformation of our continent. Some countries have a huge growth rate, many of them we could see because we are building infrastructure port, it's an airport and so on, but also let's build the capacity of the people when it comes to health, when it comes to education, when it comes to, you name them. So this is what we need to learn from Europe. So we think that Europe can help Africa to go back to the basic, either we say that it, that land issues, Let's go back and cultivate. Europe is known for that. Let's also transform our industries. The small, we don't have those small and medium enterprises. They are, it's growing now with the young people, but let's invest on that. So 
So many yeah. calls on this stage, and I'm really hearing this for, for just more to be done, generally speaking. And Thomas, uh, therefore, I'd like to ask you, because you know, as the OSCE, you very much have this need to respond to crisis very quickly. And there is a call right now, I think it's fair to say, that the OSCE do more. How do you feel about that? Well, we have uh, developed uh, over the years uh, an impressive toolbox uh, in terms of um, conflict prevention. That is uh, what you refer to um, as early warning, early action. Um, we have tools, uh, for instance, to prevent uh, minority-related uh, conflict, uh, the High Commission on National Minority. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite some tools in terms of preventive diplomacy. That is. Uh, uh, one one offer, um, uh, and, and then of course uh, tools to manage uh, conflict, make sure that the conflict does not spin out of control. That is typically what we are currently doing in in the Donbas, uh, but also in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, uh, in uh, in Georgia, um, in Transnistria. Uh, but then we also try to uh, bring. Uh, these conflicts closer to resolution. Here, uh, you need tools on the one hand, but you also need political will by the parties if you want to resolve these uh, conflicts. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, uh, we uh, have also tools uh, that I would uh, argue fall into the category of, of peace building. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is very much uh, about contributing to building strong institutions. Uh, democratic institutions, uh, uh, institutions in the area of rule of law, uh, which again, I think, uh, then contribute to an enable, enabling environment for economic activities, uh, oh. for investment. That is uh, what the OEC has on offer. Um, at the end of the day, it depends uh, on our clients, on participating states, uh, to call on, on these tools. Uh, you cannot impose uh, uh, particularly not uh, uh, conflict management tools on, on anybody. Uh, but again, we have instruments, we have institutions, we have 16 field pre presences, and, uh, and they have uh, quite something on offer. So it's a matter of political will and building that political will as well. And um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to say that um, for our session, I, I would like to leave us on a positive note, perhaps. Um, we don't have so much time left, but in the time left that we do have, I'd like to ask all of our panelists two questions. What's on your wish list? And what do you think that we can achieve together this year in terms of security and development? So wish list, what can we achieve this year? This is our action plan, because we're, we're moving from crisis response to crisis prevention. Kristalina. What is on my wish list is the ability of the world to stay focused. A conflict, when it is on the front page, grabs our attention. When it slips on the last page or out of sight, but it is still there, we do not achieve sustainable peace. So that is on my number one on my wish list is conflicts are often protracted, they, they flare, they calm down, they flare again. Our attention tends to be with a short span. Fix it, stay focused for as long as it takes so there can be sustainable Peace. Well, I, I just kind of building on the same, I, I think the fundamental issue is that sometimes we know problems are happening and we're slow in reacting to them. And as we are slow in reacting to them, they only get worse. It's a little bit of saying the same uh, in a different way what Cristalina was Improve saying. speed. So definitely the speed. We have, for instance, uh, right now, big humanitarian crisis in Venezuela people living and going throughout the hemisphere. The World Bank did a fascinating fund 
to support people uh, who were going largely from Syria to Jordan and to Lebanon. You know, this is a big, big problem. The more you let it fester, the more these problems become bigger. And secondly, I think uh, the capacity to, to get that focus and the quick reaction of governments to deal with these problems becomes essential. What can we achieve within the next year? I hope that we can continue to keep this focus on the need that uh, on these development issues you really have to think out of the box but work together. Thomas, I'd like to ask you, what's on your wish list? What do you think we can achieve? Enlightened political leadership, uh, political leaders that are ready to reinvest uh, in a rule-based global order in uh, strong multilateral institutions. That's on my wish list. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I would wish uh, could be achieved, or what I hope uh, could be achieved uh, within uh, the next year, well, uh, progress in moving towards resolving the conflict in and around Ukraine, um, implementing uh, the Minsk agreements, uh, I think that is so fundamental. Taking inspiration from the progress in the Transnistrian settlement process where uh, we uh, can see that if there is political will by the parties, if the international community pushes in the same direction, progress is even possible in a, a protracted conflict. Binta, what's on your wish list? Um, when I one started, thing. one thing, when I started being this uh, special envoy of the African Union, few countries had a plan of action on women, peace and security. Right now, I have helped 22 countries in Africa with the women, peace and security agenda, for women to participate. For me, when women contribute to peace and security, I think we have a sustainable peace and development. And my wish is to make sure that all African member states have a plan of action. I started with 22, but if I am able to get more African women, uh, people, countries, women contributing, being part of mediation in prevention, women leaders in all spheres of life, I think we will get there. So my wish is to make sure that that agenda of women, peace, and security is widespread in Africa. And on that positive note, I would like to say I hope that uh, we provided a bit of insight today on the importance of security and development, and I think that we have some hopeful message messages that we uh, leave with today. You've been watching the Deutsche Welle debate at the World Economic Forum in New York. Many thanks to our panelists here today, and we do hope for progress on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.